So we started recording, uh, we're all set, um, and we are starting this webinar. I wanna welcome uh, everyone to this Americans for Peace Now webinar. I'm Ori Mir, and with me is APN's Director of, Gov of Government Relations, Madeline Cherugino. Um, I will soon introduce our guests. Uh, I hope it'll be guests. I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment. And before I do that, um, the usual housekeeping notes. As you know, our webinars are recorded. We upload the audio to our podcast, PeaceCast, and then the video to our YouTube channel. Uh, we'll try to do that uh, later today. Uh, and then you'd be able to share it with friends and review it, uh, re-listen to it if you'd like. Uh, the other note, as you know, uh, I hope is that you're always welcome to ask questions. You can start doing it right away if you'd like. Uh, you do that uh, by uh, inserting a text uh, question, textual question into the Q&A using the Q&A tool. The Q&A tool is at the bottom of your screen, bottom left um, should be. Uh, and we ask that you keep your questions short so it would be easier for us to read it. We read it as they come along. So it's kind of on air um, during the, the actual webinar. Uh, the topic we're discussing today is something that's really close to my heart, both because our panelists are good friends and they're close to my personal heart uh, as individuals. Uh, I met them years ago, uh, or maybe I should say many years ago. Um, I think that I met Daoud in uh, 1986, first time, um, when I was a reporter covering Palestinian affairs for uh, the Israeli newspaper Haaretz. Uh, at the time, uh, there, the, there were very close professional and personal relationships between Israeli and Palestinian journalists. We'll maybe talk a little bit more about it later. Uh, today, I think we see less of that. Uh, I feel that I owe a great deal of gratitude to Palestinian journalists who really helped me with invaluable information and analysis. And in some cases, um, saved me. Uh, one or two cases actually saved my life, I think. Uh, I know it sounds uh, ominous, but it is. Yeah, that was the case. Um, among those journalists uh, are uh, Daoud Kutab and Muhammad Dagarme. Uh, Daoud is with us. Muhammad uh, will hopefully join us soon. He had to cover a press conference in Ramallah in which President Abbas uh, is presenting the or presented just now the findings of the Palestinian authorities probe into the circumstances of the killing of Palestinian journalist Shirin Abu Akleh. Um, and this was an event that actually prompted uh, this or initiated the, this, this webinar, prompted us to, to initiate this webinar, I should say. Um, both Daoud and Hamad have worked uh, for both Palestinian publications and non-Palestinian publications, uh, coping with a lot of challenges and restrictions and pressures. Um, Daoud, thank you for joining us. Thank you. And again, I hope that uh, Muhammad will be able to join us uh, later on when, as, we, as we go along with, with this webinar. Uh, so as I said, we decided to have this conversation following the uh, tragic, extremely tr tragic and, and, and upsetting killing of Shirin Abu Akleh, the Al Jazeera reporter who was covering uh, an Israeli raid in the West Bank town of Janine. Um, the shot uh, that killed her um, on the morning of May 11th uh, was heard around the world, as the expression goes, uh, and it really spotlighted the experience of Palestinian journalists who are covering the conflict between their people and Israel under Israeli occupation, and often, often under the pressure uh, of the Palestinian government as well, and Palestinian society. Um, that would you you knew Shireen, right? Yes. Yes, and I know that Muhammad was a personal friend of hers uh, and spent a lot of, of time covering events with her. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to convey my condolences, APN's condolences, and the condolences of the many people who've joined us on this webinar uh, to you and through you to uh, Shireen's uh, colleagues. Um, you know, in, in a post that uh, Mohammed Dararme posted yesterday on Facebook, he wrote, and this is a quote, uh, your departure, Shireen, was an earthquake that shook man, thoughts, present, past and future, 
a departure similar to the departure of princes, nobles, and heroes in ancient, ancient Greek legends, a departure of the kind that grieves the nation, shakes its old convictions, and opens the way to the birth of new convictions. So I wanted to start by asking you, though, why do you think there's been such a public embrace and such a, an outpour of emotion uh, after Shireen was, was killed? Uh, why did she become such an icon or was she an icon before? Uh, what is it that she symbolizes, uh, symbolized, uh, and what did her death symbolize uh, and mean for Palestinians? Well, uh, Shireen uh, began her career uh, with uh, Al Jazeera, uh, widely uh, watched TV station. Um, at one time, there were 60 million Arabs watching Al Jazeera Arabic. Um, and she covered this, I mean, she started one year after Al Jazeera broke uh, or launched, and she covered mostly the second intifada. Um, Shireen never married, her parents both are dead, and so she was always available, and especially at uh, strange hours, whenever things happen, she would go. Um, and what I think personally uh, made Shireen different than most TV journalists is that on camera, she was extremely non-emotional. I've never seen a journalist that is so connected to a conflict that can cover a story with such information, with such power, but try her best to uh, to keep a straight face. And, and I, I, I personally appreciate that a lot. And I think anyone who understands journalism understands how difficult it is for journalists especially if they're connected to their community in their town to on camera act in such an unemotional way. Um, but Shireen basically it became a household name. I mean, you know, imagine if you watch every day uh, Anderson Cooper, for example, every night you watch Anderson Cooper and all of a sudden you don't see him anymore. You know, it's, it's, an, it's like something, it's an emptiness in your life. You know, you always knew her. You know her voice, you know her face, you know her uh, demeanor, and all of a sudden she's no longer there. Uh, and it's not just among Palestinians. You see, the, most people don't understand that she is well known around the world. I mean, we heard the other day that Anthony, that, uh, Anthony Blinken, the Secretary of State, spoke to her brother and was telling him that you know he knew her personally, he talked to her, he listened to her, whatever. So she met and talked to officials, she met and talked to people. Um, she was really very um, well known during the Sheikh Jarrah events. So she lives in Beit Hanina, she's like her home. And so she would spend most of the hours with the people, not always on camera, uh, but she was always there. And in fact, they all commented that, that she was a, a source of comfort for them because they knew if Shireen was there, you know, things would be protected. Um, one other thing which you know would like to, I'd like to talk more about uh, later maybe is that Shireen uh, lives in Jerusalem under and she has an Israeli residency, also an American citizen, but she also had um, an Israeli government press office card, which is very very important, very rare for most journalists, and uh, her you know company uh, was uh, officially registered with Israel, so she wasn't uh, some type of uh, unknown person or media outlet. She was always there and she had the credentials other than the fact that she was wearing press and so on, but she actually was officially registered with the Israeli government, which very few Palestinians are in that such a way. Um, anyway, so uh, yes, she was a household person. She's well known by uh, viewers from Morocco to uh, Iraq and certainly in Palestine. And many outside of Palestine who, who watched her and, and, and really learned a lot about the situation in Palestine. She was one of those journalists that actually did the field work. She was never in the studio, I mean, unless they wanted to interview her, but she was always out in the field uh, with my colleague who trained with us, Majdi Ben Nur and others that, you know, they became uh, part of, of people's lives. You know, you have dinner and you watch and you see Shireen. So it's it's that kind of a, a connection that I think most people don't understand. I'm sure the Israeli soldier probably who shot her didn't realize what he was doing and what kind of re re reaction would happen.
Thank you so much, Daoud. Um, you know, this week CNN published a thorough investigative piece that concluded that um, Shireen was intentionally targeted by an Israeli soldier um, rather than, you know, a accidental stray bullet in a firefight. From your experience, are Palestinian journalists targeted in conflict situations as they do their jobs, um, either in a lethal manner or in other ways? And, um, you know, what in your experience bolsters your impression or conviction that Shireen was in fact targeted? Look, I mean, put things in perspective, okay? Um, most Palestinian journalists would not come close to where the Israeli soldiers are because they're not certified the way I was explaining. They don't have the press card, they don't have the, the gear, they don't have the protection of an international media agency. So most journalists don't even come close to them. But those who do come close and people like Shireen, people working for the BBC and others, uh, again, to be kind of fair, they have often been in, in, in areas that are in conflict and you know one cannot say that this is um, um, generally targeted. I mean, the Israeli soldiers don't every day target soldier, uh, journalists who are professionally uh, mandated. So, I mean, to be fair, okay, I think we have to also put things in perspective. In, her, in this situation, a number of things are were different that I think need to be explained. And I think uh, people will understand them more. First, in my experience, Every time you you go away from the center of Jerusalem and Ramallah and Bethlehem areas, the 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 targeting is increased. The the chance of targeting is increased. So the farther you are, and certainly at six o'clock in the morning, it's it's a it's much higher a chance that that a soldier might target or might try to get you out of the way. Secondly, but the, why is they, that though? Why, why is that? Well, because most international journalists don't go that. I mean, most international journalists, AP, uh, Reuters, AFP, or uh, whatever, they depend on local uh, stringers. And so local stringers don't have the kind of power and credibility and, and ability to, for the Israelis to take them seriously. So they, that's why a lot of things happen in Gaza and Jenin that are the, the worst kinds of violations happen there. Secondly, what happened a day or two before, I'm not sure which day, the Israeli government or the political level said publicly that there are no more restrictions, that the army is allowed to work without restrictions. I don't know over if you follow that, that statement or whatever, but, but it was clear because there was a lot of pressure on the Israelis because of what was happening, that they wanted to show to the Israeli public that the army is not being restricted which is very strange. I mean, they are under, they are occupying power and there are restrictions according to the Geneva Convention. So the, the fact that the, the political level removed the restrictions is very scary, okay? And that could explain why, although Israeli soldiers don't every day shoot, a, a, you know, credible uh, registered journalists, at this time they had the green light or the strong yellow light to do whatever they had to do. Third thing, which is important for people to understand, is that this happened early in the morning and there was an involvement of the Dov Devan, which is the um, special Israeli unit that is involved in um, dressing up like Arabs and going into, uh, if you watch Fauda, I think <laughs> you would know about the Dov Devan group. And so um, the fact is that Shirin was there when probably some type of an, a secret attempt was, going, was being taken or whatever. Uh, soldiers and their local commanders had basically no restrictions or were given a green light to do whatever they had to do to do their job. So all these things combined uh, explain why, I'm not saying justified, certainly it's absolutely not justifiable, but explain why, although Israeli journalists might not shoot and kill uh, Sharina Abu Akhle outside of the Damascus Gate, they might do it in Jenin. Got it, thanks. Um, I'd like to ask you a bit about, uh, about journalism under occupation. Um, uh, you, you mentioned a, a few things earlier uh, regarding the, the kind of restrictions that there are um, in working uh, under occupation. Uh, 
are Palestinian journalists free to do their work in general? What kind of restrictions or barriers do they encounter? Uh, barriers which are which are which either foreign correspondents or Israeli members of the press do not encounter. Well, the first thing I need to explain to your audience is that in the Israeli army's uh, terminology, there are no Palestinian journalists. This the status, the um, I mean, there are medical people, and I suppose, but for for them, there is nothing that is termed Palestinian journalists. There are Arab journalists working for the foreign press, or there are Israeli journalists, but that the concept of a Palestinian journalist working for a Palestinian media does not exist. There is no press card that you can apply for if you're a Palestinian working for a Palestinian media. There are press cards that you get if like you, Shireen, you work for Al Jazeera or for the BBC or for the New York Times, even if you're a Palestinian Arab. But a Palestinian working for a local Palestinian media in Nablus or in Gaza or in Jenin or in Bethlehem will never get an actual press credential, which again is a violation of the Geneva Conventions because it actually states that the occupying power must present or must uh, issue uh, credentials to local journalists. So the concept of a Palestinian journalist does not exist in the Israeli army's uh, lexicon. So you're stopped at a checkpoint and you say, I'm a journalist, they means nothing, they throw your, it means nothing. You have no, uh, no. Um, it's not that we should get special status, but, but journalists are allowed in areas that, you know, even in war zones or in, you have the, you know, what happened in Texas, journalists can get into locations where a press conference or whatever that others, except if you're Iraq Baron, what's his name? The Texas, uh, um, competitor of uh, Abbott, but anyway, journalists are are allowed to attend press conferences. They are allowed to be there, but Palestinian journalists, without the Israeli issued press card for foreign media, uh, cannot do their work and cannot travel. I'll give you an example. We did a, a big survey um, after the uh, the war on Gaza in nineteen. Um, in 2018, uh, International Press Institute sent a delegation of three people, I was one of them, to check a uh, situation of, of the journalism in Israel, Palestine, Gaza, and the West Bank, and so on. And one of the conclusions we came up with is that Gazan journalists are not allowed to travel into Israel or even to the West Bank. Palestinian journalists are not allowed to go to Gaza. Palestinian journalists are not allowed to go to Jerusalem. And so, um, because they are not, they don't have the privilege of an Israeli or foreign journalist who with his press card can attend. And so, hi, Muhammad. Um, so uh, that means that we as journalists without these uh, press cards are restricted and cannot move from one location to another. And, and that, you know, that is one of the, many issues that, of course, uh, again, the Israelis treat a Palestinian journalist working for Palestinian media like he treats anybody else. They're foreign combatants, any one of them could be a terrorist. And so there is no um, uh, special status given to a Palestinian journalist unless you work for a foreign media. Thanks, Daoud. And I'd like to uh, welcome uh, Mohamed Dararme, who just uh, join, uh, joined us. Um, I understand that you covered the, the press conference, Hamad. Maybe you could just give us a, a quick update on what, what it was. Uh, hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. yes. I think yes, you can hear me. Uh, sorry, I just came out from the press conference. The Attorney General, Palestinian Attorney General, revealed uh, in this press conference the results of the Palestinian uh, investigation into the uh, uh, killing of Abu Akli. Uh, he says basically they they found the bullet. The bullet hit the head from uh, here, from the the, the, um, the back uh, head, uh, the the left side of the back head, and uh, uh, got through uh, uh, the brain, damaged, uh, causing the damage to the brain, which caused the death, and hit the helmet and um, uh, uh, bounced uh, to the uh, 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 damaged uh, brain. So they found the, the, the bullet. The bullet uh, shows, according to their lab, the check of their lab, that um, uh, it is uh, um, it called uh, Mini 40 Rogers. 
uh, from uh, 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 a machine gun, uh, 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 half automatic machine gun, he said. Uh, and um, this uh, bu bullet ha uh, had uh, a steel head and um, it is uh, it can penetrate uh, the arm uh, the armored uh, that what uh, he said about uh, the bullets and he said basically the the investigation uh, showed that um, there was an Israeli force uh, to the uh, southern side from the journalist where Abakli was standing with other journalists. And at the time, there was no clashes of anyhow. And uh, she and her colleagues uh, uh, subjected uh, to the fire from uh, 170 to 180 meters from that side. And he explained technically uh, where she was standing. She turned around, she tried to hide, and then it, she was hit uh, directly. And uh, the Palestinians have handed over, uh, have sent a, 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 a copy of the uh, report to the American side because she holds uh, American citizenship, uh, plus to, the, to her family and to uh, Al Jazeera. Uh, now, the, the spokesman of the president was uh, uh, present at the press conference, Nabil Abordena, and he said that the Palestinians are going to, uh, to sue the killers, uh, uh, and the killers will not get away with their crimes. They will going to sue them. Uh, I um, I got some of the record stuff that they are going to um, uh, to file uh, three lawsuits. One to the ICC uh, through the family. One to uh, an American court and one to a Palestinian court. And they will refrain from uh, filing any suit lawsuit to the uh, uh, Israeli side. Uh, uh, fearing that uh, that would uh, be used by the Israeli side uh, to, to escape and to get away with it, uh, citing the fact that uh, 55 journalists were killed uh, uh, by Israeli forces during operations in West Bank and Gaza, and only three cases were uh, referred to court and uh, they were uh, buried uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the Israeli courts. That basically the uh, the summary of the press conference. Thank you so much, Mohammed. Um, you know, we were talking a little bit about the CNN report or came out earlier this week with similar findings, and um, you know, we understand that when Shireen was in Janine with a group of other journalists, um, her colleagues said that when they saw the Israeli soldiers there, they made eye contact and signaled to them that they were present. Um, so is that common practice? It, it, you know, what kind of, uh, and why? Actually, yes, uh, it is uh, common. And uh, we were wondering um, why uh, um, the Israelis, uh, we were wondering why she uh, went closer. I asked the Chief of Al Jazeera, why she went that close and he he reminded me of the fact that we journalists we always report uh, from uh, next to the israeli tanks when they were in the middle of the of ramallah we moved uh, to uh, to be in eye contact with them in their in their side and uh, we used to report uh, that closely uh, from the, the the israeli military so those journalists uh, according to the, the report and according to the to themselves when they uh, gave interviews saying that we we showed the soldiers from a short distance our vests our helmets that we are journalists uh, so uh, to to avoid us and uh, to avoid any uh, misunderstanding or any any suspicion so yeah B B palestinian journalists usually do that but now i think we, we as journalists, we discuss that every day. We, 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 we meet every day uh, and, and gathering for Shireen. And we say now that we should uh, be extra careful simply because uh, we, we have been reading and investigating. And uh, 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 we looked again to the uh, breaking the silence uh, Israeli group of soldiers who, who, who were involved in such uh, 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 incidents and um, uh, shooting, 
many of them in their uh, uh, testimonies said that they were sometimes amusing themselves by shooting at Palestinians. Sometimes they were bitting each other. Can I hit? Uh, uh, can you bit me that I can hit that one in the mouth? And the, the, those are uh, on the internet. Anyone can can go and see what the uh, breaking the silence. Israeli former Israeli soldiers are giving testimonies ab about that kind of of behavior that's common uh, in, in the Israeli military. And we have you know, we have covered hundreds of, of such cases like Shireen. We have co covered hundreds of them. And uh, uh, apparently, the Adrialine and the journalists, when they are in the field, they forget themselves. And myself, I, I was an, a, a, a witness of, of a killing of uh, when I was working for AP. And, uh, our uh, cameraman in Nablus was filming uh, uh, stone throwing confrontation between school kids, school kids, literally school kids, and Israeli military. And the soldiers shoot him, shoot him dead. So uh, from short distance, that, and you can find that in the archive of AP. AP reported that in, two, uh, in two, uh, 2002. Uh, so, uh, yes, it is risky, always risky for journalists um, to, uh, to, to do their jobs. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, Daoud and uh, Mohammed, uh, a, a question that is a little sensitive, I think, to, for both Palestinian and, and Israeli journalists. You know, as, it was, uh, as I was preparing for today's webinar, I recalled uh, a conversation that I had many years ago with the late uh, Radwan Abu Ayash, who was the uh, director of the Palestinian Press Association for many years. And he was reacting to an article that I had written uh, a long time ago, this was many years ago, scolding Palestinian journalists for being biased and ideologically driven uh, and ideologically mobilized. And his point, which was well taken, is that in a situation of an occupation, both the media of the occupier and the media of the occupied cannot really be objective or impartial. So I wanted to ask you about that. I want to ask you, do Palestinian journalists generally strive to be unbiased? Do they view themselves first and foremost as a part of the anti-occupation effort of their society? Or are, there, are they first and foremost beholden to professional standards and, and norms? Do you want to start I think the question, I think the question um, you know, requires maybe an hour webinar by itself, but, but let me try to break it down a few uh, points. First of all, there are at least three different types of journalists that uh, exist, the types of work. Those who go on the field, and those who uh, cover uh, in writing news and those who write opinions. And each has its own uh, parameters of work. Um, the concept of objective journalism, I think, has long been uh, dismissed around the world. There is no objective journalist anywhere in the world because the moment you choose a headline, the moment you choose a lead, the lead of your story, uh, you're setting and making a, a subjective decision. Uh, we always teach and tell people that they have to be fair and honest and truthful. So if two people died, you can't say 10 people died. That is not nothing to do with objectivity, it's about truth. So journalists have to be truthful. Now, uh, will, are Palestinian journalists biased? Yes. Are Israeli journalists biased? Yes. Are American journalists biased? Yes. Are Russian journalists biased in Ukraine? Yes. Are Ukrainian journalists in Ukraine biased? Yes. I mean, we saw what was, what was done with the Ukrainian war. The American press was more Ukrainian than Ukrainian. So that issue doesn't really bother me. What bothers me is if factual news, if you're writing and writing, filming, whatever, you have to give the audience the facts. Um, then uh, if you're doing an opinion, what I when I write my opinions, I always put in the bottom that I'm a Palestinian journalist. So you take, you know, take that I'm already uh, biased and an opinion by its nature is an opinion piece. So I think, uh, again, I don't think there is objectivity. I think under occupation, uh, it's even more difficult because in Israel, you are, uh, you belong to a, an, 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 a sovereign country. 
uh, you work for uh, paid for media outlet. In Palestine, we don't have the um, um, environment of a proper country. We don't have the environment of proper media uh, financially. There's no, uh, I mean, most media is either government owned or government supported. And so as a result, uh, it's hard to be totally uh, divorced from uh, the media uh, environment that you live in or from the, the public that you are working with. So, yeah, I, I think, you know, we should take uh, a, an Israeli uh, reporter's uh, stories or a Palestinian reporter's stories with a grain of salt. Um, I would say in the Palestinian situation, since we're really not a state yet, I think, Again, one has to understand that that uh, you know belong to a, a population that is in a liberation mood is different than belong to a country that is sovereign and stable. Um, but again, the most important point is to be fair and factual, and not to exaggerate and not to lie to your audience. Objectivity. Let's keep that out of the discussion. I think. Ahmed, do you want to add to it anything? Uh, I agree with uh, Dawood. Uh, definitely, I agree uh, with uh, Dawood. Um, and uh, I may add that uh, uh, what bothered me most in uh, this um, uh, 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 shocking uh, crime, shocking uh, loss that um, I've read and seen many Israeli journalist comments and reporting, and they're reporting. They were not reporting about the case, about Shireen uh, um, herself, but rather they were reporting about saying she was she's um, uh, anti-Israeli. She was working for anti-Israeli news organization, and this and that. Uh, so a mass spokeswoman. That was uh, so so. <laughs> So unbelievable, uh, uh, although I agree with the fact that, you know, we are in, in uh, a national uh, conflict uh, and uh, by nature, Palestinians are biased to their uh, narrative and the Israelis are biased to their uh, narrative. But uh, what we lose now is a common ground, the basic journalism common ground. I think that was... Uh, common long time ago between Palestinian and Israeli journalists, but uh, this time, unfortunately not. I'm not sure. I mean, it, there was much better cooperation, uh, Mohammed, but I don't think there ever was uh, that close. I mean, we cooperated, uh, Ori and I and, and you and others, uh, we've cooperated a lot, but uh, I still think the, the media is the media. I mean, they uh, it reflects uh, bad things. Now, of course, the Israeli media has gone much further away from even the semblance of some kind of uh, uh, professionalism in the last few years. It's gone really far right wing. There's absolutely almost no investigative reporting except for, you know, Gidon and, and uh, Amira and others. There's almost nobody writing, uh, going through uh, things. I mean, we didn't need CNN and, and AP to do an investigation. Why couldn't we get uh, Haaretz or Iran to do an investigation? They could certainly get much better information from the Israeli side if they worked on it, but they gave up. I mean, they just, I don't know. Uh, Madeline, before you ask the next questions, I just wanted to uh, remind our audience that uh, they're welcome to ask questions and they should do it through the Q&A tool that, that's the bottom of the uh, screen. We already have several questions there and uh, you are welcome to add yours. Uh, go ahead, Madeline. Yeah, I wanted to actually turn a bit um, to, you know, freedom of the press under the PA. I know both of you have publicly criticized the PA for violations. Um, would you say that restrictions by the PA apply only to journalists working for domestic news organizations or also to ones working for international media? Uh, I think that the Palestinian um, authority violation is uh, mostly um, a season. Uh, in, in, in our daily reporting, they stay away from us. 
of course, they they restrict the coverage. There is no uh, law that um, uh, allows me to get uh, information that if they want to hide. When I was working for AP, many times we wanted to do uh, investigation, uh, investigative reporting, and we go to um, a government uh, and uh, institute, and they kick us out. So uh, uh, in the Israeli side, for example, they have such a law. And once they went, and I use that in, in my training uh, to young journalists, that uh, yes, they went to uh, the court and brought order and went to Netanyahu's place and brought all the, the details of his uh, consumption of ice cream and wine and etc. Et uh, we don't have that, uh, unfortunately, that law that allows me to go uh, to court and uh, get information about uh, President Abbas and uh, how much money he spends uh, from taxpayers and, uh, and uh, or any, any, any other uh, institution. Uh, 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 but uh, the general, uh, 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 mainly we cover the, um, we cover everything, uh, but the Israeli uh, 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 violations, uh, the Israeli uh, uh, occupation practices are much uh, more uh, dangerous and much more risky and much, uh, uh, um, uh, the, the effect uh, li uh, life of Palestinians much more. Although still it's important to cover the Palestinian side, but media face that difficulties. And um, I said uh, it's seasons, why? Because, uh, for example, when uh, uh, Nizar Banat was killed, um, uh, uh, this activist was killed, uh, they cracked Ahmed, down- Maybe just, just to remind people who Nizar Banat was, just to- Nizar Banat was um, a, a famous uh, Palestinian activist, anti-Palestinian Authority activist, and he was taken to jail and killed in his way to jail beaten up to death. So we brought, we were covering protests after math and the journalists were beaten up, their phones were taken. Uh, later on, the prime minister apologized for that, but uh, this is not the big issue. The big issue that we don't have the law and unfortunately the elections uh, stopped long time ago after the, the, the split between Fatah and Hamas and we don't have a, a parliament to per, uh, pursue such um, a law. And uh, uh, so still the Palestinian, the, the coverage <clears throat> and the Palestinian uh, um, uh, side lacks um, these, this dark area where you cannot get into uh, governmental institutions and bring uh, information sim simply because we have no law that force them to re re reveal such information. Um, I, uh, as you said, I got in trouble because we were broadcasting on in Ramallah on a session about corruption in the PA, and I was arrested for seven glorious days uh, <laughs> because I, I actually got a lot of publicity out of it. But that's not the point. Um, one of the things that actually a lot of people um, talk to me about, which makes some sense is yes, there, there is corruption, but if you compare the corruption to the existential issue of occupation and the need to be free, the weight, so if, if you're you know, an editor and you have to prioritize things, the occupation and its, its effect on the lives of everybody is much, much more important than corruption by a few. Well, it's, that is also important, the weight, that you have to give is different. I mean, I'm not uh, in agreement to this argument, but what I'm trying to say is that um, the uh, Palestinian state is not sovereign. Palestinians don't have full rights. Uh, and so the attention that is given by the media and by journalists is by and large the existential issue of occupation. Uh, not to justify corruption, not to justify absence of democratic processes, but you know, revolutions are not the democratic anywhere in the world. So uh, if you uh, agree that the Palestinians are still in the liberation and revolution period and not in the state period, then 
one can say, okay, you cannot compare the Israeli journalism and the laws in, in journalism, as, as, as Muhammad said, the access to access to information, law, and so on, and that of a, a population under occupation. So that's a kind of comparing apples and oranges, and I don't think it's a fair comparison. Um, I want to relate to something that uh, you both spoke about sort of in passing earlier, which is the um, relationship, the collaboration between Israeli and Palestinian journalists, which uh, I remember quite well from the 80s and 90s, was uh, extremely instrumental for Israeli journalists. And I think it was also very beneficial for Palestinian journalists. Uh, it seems to me like that has... Uh, shrunken quite a bit like we don't see that much of it today and i wanted to ask both if that's correct from your experience and if so why why is that why, why do you think what what do you think the reason is i think politics um uh particularly uh, uh, in the israeli side um the, so the whole society has been moving to to the right and the far right uh, in the Palestinian side, we have part of us move to the right side, like in Gaza for Hamas, and, and Hamas prohibits any cooperation uh, and, uh, uh, with, with, with Israeli uh, uh, journalists. Uh, but um, in, um, in general, um, I feel that the Israelis, after building the, the wall, uh, the whole society, not all, only the media, the political society, the media society, uh, the entire Israeli uh, uh, society is uh, uh, living uh, uh, away from the Palestinians. Uh, they don't, um, they don't uh, pay much attention to the conflict. They say, Khalas, since the, the Palestinians are behind the wall, uh, and one of the statistics, one of the surveys showed that the interest, the general interest of the, the Israelis of the conflict, uh, they uh, put it after the road accidents. They started with Iran and then the economy and then the road accident and then the Palestinian uh, uh, issue. So I think the political changes uh, made that uh, a growing gap between uh, the Palestinian journalists and Israelis. I think plus uh, plus in the uh, plus uh, sorry plus in the Palestinian side the anti uh, the BDS and anti normalization movement is growing much and uh, uh, no no one now is there dares to to to, to meet with Israel journalists. I think uh, two things that uh, I would like to point out. One is the Oslo Accords. The what, what happened with Oslo uh, caused a rift. Because it's not that it caused the rift between Israel and Palestinian journalists by itself, but all of a sudden, Palestinians had a semi government, they had a president, they have a government, a parliament, and, and that took a lot of the interest of, of the journalists and shifted the attention from the Israeli Palestinian conflict. And as a result, the Israelis paid less attention, as Mohammed said, of the Palestinian uh, issue. Uh, the second problem we have is the wall. I think the wall and the uh, breakdown uh, in Gaza, the, the split in Gaza, those two things are also made a terrible uh, retreat to cooperation because the wall meant that Palestinian journalists outside of Jerusalem could never come to Jerusalem anymore. We used to have coffee. People come from Ramallah, Nablus, Bethlehem, here in Gaza, and you would have coffee with you in East Jerusalem or even in West Jerusalem. Now uh, there was physically a, a difficult uh, uh, opportunities to meet. Israeli journalists rarely come to the West Bank anymore because of the wall and because of the um, uh, the rumors or the expectation that there, I mean, it's not an expectation, there is a sign. Israelis are not allowed to enter the Aries A. And so uh, all of that has created uh, a cold shoulder, <laughs> if I can use the word. And uh, I think that that is a problem. Thank you so much. So um, I want to ask about the, um, there's a question in the chat about whether or not the Israeli offer for a joint investigation was sincere um, and also why the Palestinian Authority did not make the bullet available for Israeli forensics. Um, do either of you have thoughts on that? 
Yes, they said that clearly in the press conference that uh, the Palestinian side does not um, trust the Israeli side, citing the fact that Israel from day one denied and tried to protect the, the killers, the, the military, and um, they came up with the several, um, seven accounts for, since uh, the, the Shirin was killed. So they said basically from our experience, Israel always uh, buried uh, um, uh, or tried to bury the, 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 the killing and the bad uh, behavior of its soldiers. So we cannot trust them. If we share with them the investigation, if we give them the bullets, then they will, they will maybe change facts and uh, we cannot trust them. Uh, we ask them why they didn't um, uh, cooperate with the American side, uh, any third party, because uh, that would give the investigation uh, more support. They didn't, their answer was not clear. They said we are qualified and we have labs and we have teams, professional teams, and we can bring facts. And then after that, we will make the investigation available. Anyone wants to, fact, to, to check the facts, we can cooperate with, with them. But Basically, we want to do the investigation and to, to prove uh, what we uh, have. Thanks. Always always helps to unmute. Um, <laughs> Daoud, uh, uh, do you want to address that as well? or No, let's move on. Okay, okay. I think Mohammed get a good answer. Um, I, a question, an issue that I wanted to uh, ask you to comment about something that I think is, is not quite known here and I think is quite interesting, uh, has to do with what it is that Palestinian reporters report on. So, uh, and that goes both for Palestinian reporters who work for international outlets uh, such as, as, as you, Muhammad, but, um, but also for Palestinians who work for Palestinian media organizations. Um, my sense has always been that Palestinians who consume Palestinian media know much more about Israel than Israelis who consume Israeli media. And I just wanted to ask you to talk a little bit about that, about um, uh, the kind of uh, imbalance that there is there. Uh, for me? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, well, this is a historic issue. It's not about Israel and Palestine, but the um, defeated or the weak side of any conflict is much more interested in the strong side. They want to learn why they did, defeated us, why are they strong, what is the reason. And so um, in South Africa, for example, Blacks know a lot more about Africaners and the whites than, than, than the other way around. In Palestine, we know a lot more about Israel and Israel. I mean, we know how many members of Knesset uh, Agudat Israel has in the Knesset. I'm sure you don't know, most Israelis don't know anything about Palestinian internal politics of Islamic Jihad versus Mubadara versus Hezb al-Shaab. You know nothing about these issues because you don't care. It's not that, I mean, you're successful, you're victorious, uh, Israel is. Um, the world all knows about America, how many, Americans know about the rest of the world. Uh, uh, you know, a small difference in the U.S. Congress is in the major news around the world. It, you know, small conflict in uh, any country in the world is not news in America. So it's a, I think it's a question of strong and weak. Uh, the, uh, the weak uh, is always wanting to learn more about the strong. Uh, so it didn't apply to the Palestinian issue. But in the Palestinian conflict, um, as you remember, we had in our daily newspapers an entire page of only translation from the Israeli press. Every single day you open up Al-Quds or Al-Ayyam or Al-Shaab or Al-Fajr at the time, and there's an entire page other than sometimes on the front page and so on. And so, uh, yes, we are much more aware because decisions made in Israel affect our lives. Decisions made in Palestine don't affect your lives most of the time. Uh, and so uh, we wanted to know if, you know, because uh, basically the Israeli government and the Minister of Defense is our ruler. He's, he or she are the decide what happens in Palestine. So we need to know what their decisions are. What are they planning to do? When will the curfew be lifted? When will we be able to go to Gaza? When will the uh, strawberries from Gaza make it to the West Bank? When will the, you know, all these things that have to do with your daily life. And sometimes literally every hour 
you listen to Israel uh, news uh, to know when the curfew will be lifted so you can go out and buy food. Uh, now, okay, in the in the major cities, we don't have that problem, but still on uh, 60 to 80, 75% of the West Bank still areas either B or C, which is under Israeli uh, military control. So there's a lot of decisions that are made in Israel that affect Palestinians. Mohammed, in, in your reporting, do you do you report for Ashark about uh, domestic Israeli affairs, Israeli politics, uh, uh, things of that sort? Yes, uh, we have um, a, a correspondent, uh, Palestinian-Israeli uh, colleague, who covers that. But I help him when he, uh, I'm the bureau chief, and when he in vacation, I, I do the reporting. So I, I don't um, uh, speak Hebrew and uh, don't read Hebrew, but uh, the Israeli uh, uh, media is available in an English version. We have Haaretz, we have um, uh, Times of Israel uh, uh, and Jer Jerusalem Post and other, and we have in Arabic as well, Makan, they have good stuff. So we are aware of, of, of the Israeli developments and uh, the Israeli society, and uh, we cover it uh, closely. Plus, we have an uh, Israeli study center in Ramallah. And they hold um, conferences, uh, lectures, they translate books. And uh, uh, plus, in our daily newspapers, we have um, uh, a full page of Israeli articles, translated articles. Uh, still, Atala Kemari, you, your old friend, still translates the Israeli uh, 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 most important uh, articles from uh, all uh, newspapers into Arabic and uh, we, 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 we read them. And uh, many of us, most of the Palestinian intellectuals started the newspaper from the Israeli page, the Israeli page simply because we wanted to know, plus, plus Israel has uh, some good uh, writers we we were raised to read uh, Nahum Barnea and uh, Gideon Levy and uh, Orinir when he was here and others. <laughs> I actually have a great story to tell about it. I, I can't uh, can't hold myself. <laughs> I was sitting. This was uh, early on when I started. I was sitting at the office uh, of Akram Hania, who was then the editor of a newspaper called Ashab, and we were talking about stuff. And a translator who translated from Hebrew to Arabic uh, heard our conversation from the other room and came in and said, ah, I, I heard your voice. I heard that you were here. I wanted to ask you about an article that you wrote that I was just translating. What did you mean here when you wrote that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's, good. That's, That's right. a good story. <laughs> yeah. When, once I told uh, Nahum Bernier, who I'm a big fan of, uh, uh, that I teach him uh, I, uh, to, to, to Palestine, and he was excited. I told him in, in Birzeit University we teach you, and he said, please take me to, uh, to Birzeit University. I told him this is something I cannot do, <laughs> but I can bring your articles, not you yourself. Do you, do you, I mean, you, you live obviously among Palestinian society, um, uh, you, you live among Palestinians. Uh, is there social pressure on you to report in some way or another? Uh, do people criticize your reporting um, at all? To you, Muhammad. Uh, look, the Palestinian society um, uh, has some taboos, you know, religion issues, uh, sex issues, uh, this kind of stuff, particularly religion uh, issues. These are red lines, but uh, politically, no, it's, it's, it's open. Um, it's an open society for, you know, Palestine was known in, among the Arabs that it has uh, the most of, of uh, political spectrum. You find every political idea in the, in the world here in Palestine, from communism to uh, nationalism, to Islamism, Iranian Islamic, Islamism, uh, Muslim Brotherhood, all kinds of um, uh, 
political spec spectrum. So um, the only thing is is very sensitive is religion. If you report something against religion, then you are done. You might be uh, lynched in the street. Do you have any opinion on it, um, uh, Daoud? I'm answering uh, somebody oh. on your thing, but um, okay. <laughs> um, look, we're under pressure, as uh, Muhammad said, uh, in the area of normalization. It's very, very difficult. Uh, a few years ago, my son was trying to do a, a documentary about Jerusalem. Uh, it's called uh, Jerusalem 24, where um, over 24 hours you film like 50 different Israelis and Palestinians and it's all shown in one time exactly the same moment what was happening here and there and he was attacked and I was attacked uh, for normalization even though this was not to the German project but still people said you're cooperating with the Israelis and uh, for somebody and now especially I'm doing more work in Jordan it's almost a career ending if you're attacked as being a normalizer. So it's very, very difficult to deal with this issue uh, in a public way. Yes, we cooperate with Israeli journalists privately, but publicly it's very, very difficult. Yeah. So um, as I already mentioned at the beginning, I do government affairs for APN. Um, so I forgive me for this question, but it also came from the chat. So I was excited to ask it of you. Um, but what can Americans do um, particularly to support the, in, investigation of Shireen's death and, um, you know, pursue justice. I know last week, um, representatives Carson Correa and Pascrell in the House sent a letter to um, the FBI director and Secretary of State Blinken calling for an independent U.S. investigations from both of those departments. Um, but beyond that, like how else can regular Americans support, um, you know, her getting justice? I think, look, the Palestinians now um, uh, are waiting to see the world, what the world can do to, to them. The Palestinians are frustrated from uh, the world's political approach, starting started from uh, the Iranian, uh, the, sorry, the, the Russian-Ukrainian war, uh, the, or the Russian war in Ukraine, uh, when they saw the world providing Ukraine with all um, political, economical, uh, humanitarian assistance at all levels, while Palestine has been under occupation for decades and no one is paying any attention. Uh, so the, the Palestinians got frustrated and you feel their frustration and that uh, um, resulted in, I think my analysis, that resulted in, in these deadly, unusual attacks by some uh, uh, young Palestinians, I think, because that that contributed to their frustration. Uh, now, with the Shireen killing, Shireen, um, uh, uh, this incident uh, is a national one. Um, uh, the whole nation is is around it, and uh, unlike other um, uh, event incidents, Shireen's. Uh, um, was killed two weeks ago, but as if it was killed today, it is uh, the talk of the town every, every day. And if the world won't provide uh, uh, justice to her, I think that would contribute more to the frustration and uh, the, 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 the political frustration and the human frustration, and that would result in, in other extreme uh, uh, behaviors or attacks or, or uh, so uh, America can since she is an American I, I personally blame the Palestinians for not uh, bringing the Americans into the investigation because if the FBI came and participate in the autopsy and everything and the uh, forensic in everything, uh, uh, if the Americans came and participated, then the report would have uh, much more uh, uh, credibility and uh, influence, and you can go to the American courts. Yet the Americans can can resume now since the Palestinians have ended their investigation. The Americans can do their uh, independent one and uh, provide the results as AP and CNN and other American news outlets have done. So I think it is a big responsibility since the Americans cannot uh, 
cannot do anything to to solve the conflict. They they stand still. They are not uh, exerting any uh, real efforts uh, in this regard. They can at least they are focusing now on on day to day issues and solving day to day issues and humanitarian uh, issues. They they can consider this one of the areas that they can can work and uh, that won't bring down the Israeli government. They are concerned that any pressure might bring down this government, but the investigation is professional and someone uh, needs to, to, to be held uh, accountable for, for, for this crime. I think the Americans um, did themselves a disfavor by refusing to link uh, financial aid to Israel. Uh, I think this is the biggest scandal in, in, Israel, in the US uh, foreign policy is every country in the world that gets money, that money is conditional. Uh, what, whether the condition is light or heavy, whether it's uh, strong or weak, but there is some conditionality. This is the only country in the world that gets the most amount of money, one country, there is no conditionality. And I think that weakens the ability of Americans in a case like Shireen, where an American uh, is killed uh, while uh, international, uh, sorry, US law says, the FBI must investigate these cases, uh, whether the Palestinians agreed to it or not. I don't know that they didn't. Uh, the FBI was running into Ramallah and people told them not to come, but I don't know. Uh, the fact is that uh, the U.S. government um, was quiet. I, I, I want to go back a little bit further, you know, uh, for until Bennett became prime minister, every single Israeli prime minister has always said, we want to negotiate with the Palestinians, the Palestinians who don't want to negotiate, okay? So peace is not because Israel doesn't want it, it's because the Palestinians don't want it. Naftali Bennett sat in the White House and said, we're not going to meet with the Palestinians, we're not going to negotiate with them. And nothing happened. Nobody said anything. Until now, uh, you know, a, a military occupation is going on and there is not, not only is there fake uh, under like Netanyahu, he was lying, that he wanted to negotiate a two-state solution. But now, publicly, they're boasting, Neftal is boasting, I don't meet with Abbas, I will not allow anyone to meet with Abbas on political level, only on economic level. This is, I mean, I can't understand how this is not causing a political earthquake. You, the Unfortunately, the Biden government, okay, they're saying Neftali Bennett had a very thin majority, and if he loses, Netanyahu comes back and so on. I don't care. Sorry. I, I mean, if you are American official, your foreign policy is that there should, I mean, now you're talking about ending the Russian occupation of Ukraine. There should be, you know, some, somebody was telling me at the UN last week, we spent five years trying to get investigators from the ICC and nothing happened. The Americans in five days were able to get 42 different investigators into Ukraine to investigate. How do you fathom those two things? I mean, it's a total double standard. And I'm sorry, the Americans gave up that power that they have with the money and the veto and all the other things to the Israelis. All right. So um, as, as I always say at the end of these uh, webinars, you know, it's, a, it's a, a great example of how fast one hour can, can pass. And this one uh, was, was no exception. I wanted to uh, thank you both uh, for joining us, Daoud and Muhammad, and particularly to you, Muhammad. I, I know you had to rush uh, to join, and I, I really appreciate, appreciate that you, you did that. Um, and, uh, and of course, Madeline, thank you for joining us as well. Um, still recovering <laughs> from, from COVID. Um, and uh, yeah, so this ends our, our webinar. Um, and uh, so there was a question earlier in the uh, Q&A about whether this is recorded. So as I said in the beginning, yes, we are recording this. Uh, we will post the audio on our podcast, Peacecast and the video uh, will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. So with this again, thanks everyone for joining us and thank you Daoud and Muhammad. Bye. Bye now, yep. thank you.